Good morning, everyone. My name is Jill D'Alessandro, and I am the curator of costume and textile arts here at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. It is my great pleasure to introduce this program today, a panel discussion regarding the life and work of Rudolf Nureyev. Um, and we are doing this in honor of the kickoff as the opening day of the exhibition, um, Rudolf Nureyev, A Life in Dance. And I am so pleased to have the exhibition open, and I'm so pleased because now I can sit back and enjoy all of these wonderful programs that my colleagues in the public programming and our incredible collaboration <coughs> with the San Francisco Ballet. Um, none of these programs would have been possible without the incredible generous support of um, Mrs. Denise Littlefield Sobel. So thank you, Denise. Um, <laughs> Um, before we, I introduce uh, the executive director, Glenn McCoy, of the San Francisco Ballet, I just want to say a few things. Um, your ticket for this panel discussion will include um, admittance into the exhibition, so please do go upstairs afterwards. And we will be collecting questions um, at, the, at the end of the row. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please write them on the paper that was handed out to you. Um, at, when you entered and um, pass it to the end of the euro. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the executive director of the San Francisco Ballet, Glenn McCoy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all for turning out uh, this morning. Uh, there will be uh, 15 minutes set aside at the end of our discussion to uh, answer any questions you might have. Uh, I am Glenn McCoy, Executive Director of San Francisco Ballet, and the ballet is honored to collaborate with the Fine Arts Museum uh, on several events and activities related to the new ex exhibition, Rudolf Nureyev, A Life in Dance, an exhibition that naturally holds uh, great significance for those of us who work in dance because of Nureyev's tremendous influence on and popularizing of our dance form, of our art form. Uh, Rudolf Nureyev was a true superstar on stage and off. Through his talent and charisma, he brought new popularity to classical dance. Indeed, he became a pop icon, identifiable by an admiring public far beyond the Valletta mains who would travel the globe just to see him perform. He was driven, uh, held himself and others to very high standards. Uh, he had taste and elegance which belied his very humble birth. He was complicated, famous, and infamous. He was intellectually curious and a genuine product of his time. It is my great privilege to facilitate today's dis discussion with four people who knew Rudolf Nureyev, worked with him, and who can, because of their own extensive experience in the world that Nureyev inhabited, uh, gave can give us in, uh, valuable insights into this immensely talented and enigmatic artist, insights which, which we hope uh, will provide you an even richer experience viewing the impressive exhibition that the museum has mounted. We will explore uh, themes of Nureyev's influence on the art form as a dancer, as a dance partner, as a choreographer, and as the director of a major ballet company. Uh, I would first like to introduce my panelists, uh, Martin Kamer, renowned costume designer, builder, and collector, uh, who worked on many ballet productions with Nureyev for more than two decades. Secondly, Helgi Thompson, who, as you know, has been artistic director of San Francisco Ballet since 1985. He began his professional career in the U.S. with the Joffrey and Harkness Ballets. 1969, he won the silver medal at the first international ballet competition in Moscow, representing the United States. The following year, he joined George Balanchine's New York City Ballet, where he danced for 15 years, becoming one of the most celebrated dancers of his generation. Mena Gilgood's long and varied career includes performing leading roles as a principal dancer with London Festival Ballet, Sadler's Wells, Royal Ballet, and the Ballet de Marseille, as well as creating works with Maurice Bijard's uh, 20th Century Ballet. She was the artistic director of the Australian Ballet and the Royal Danish Ballet. 
Uh, she continues to work with the great international ballet companies, teaching, coaching, and staging important works, including those of uh, Nuria. Uh, we are especially happy that she's in San Francisco Ballet these days, staging the company premiere of Serge Lafarge's great Suite en Blanc. And Patrick Armand, celebrated French dancer who in 1980 won the Prix de Lausanne, and in 1983 was nominated for a Laurence Olivier Award for his performance in Béjar's Song of a Wayfarer with Rudolf Dereyev. In addition to his long career as a dancer, Patrick has had a distinguished career as a ballet master, teacher, and stager of ballet works, including those of Nureyev around the world. And we are very fortunate that since 2010, Patrick has been the principal of San Francisco Ballet's prestigious trainee program. We have our trainees with us today. Uh, and just last month became the associate director of the San Francisco Ballet School. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for participating. I thought it would be interesting to start by having each of you describe your first meeting with Rudolph. <laughs> what were your impressions? Martin. Well, I met him, I was working for a designer and he came in and of course we were very excited because Rudolph was a, a myth, even then in the early 60s. Um, oh, okay. Uh, when I've, I met him first working for a designer that designed for Rudolf, and he came in, and of course, all his assistants were incredibly excited because he was this myth. Um, and uh, at that stage, we called it Rudy Mania. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was, you know, this person came in who was mythical, and that's the only thing I can describe it. We're going to talk about the production I know you're referring to in yeah. a second, because yeah. that's very interesting. Okay. Am, am I next? Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Um, I had um, been at the School of American Ballet for uh, a winter season on a scholarship and went back to Denmark. Um, I had a job offer there. Didn't know what I should do, so um, if I should go back to New York or not. Someone um, who knew Eric Brune very well recommended that I should go and see him. So the arrangement was made. I went down to the Royal Danish Theater and uh, met Eric Brun. And as he, I said who I was, and he expected me there. And he said, well, let me introduce you to this dancer, Rudolf Nureyev, who had just defected a few days earlier. Um, obviously, uh, we did not communicate because I was not there to t talk to him, but that was my first uh, meeting with him, um, which led to Eric Brun suggesting, of course, you have to go back to, to New York, and um, which I did. And within like maybe a month or, or two later, I was invited through Eric uh, to a, a big party in New York because he was supposed to be dancing on television. and. Um, he didn't dance, something happened, so Rudolf danced. And Rudolf came to this party, and um, I didn't know anybody, so I sort of stood by the door. <laughs> he, Eric and, and he came in with uh, Tall Chief, and everybody grabbed Eric and the Tall Chief, Maria Tall Chief. Uh, so Nureyev and I stood there by the door, we didn't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how our sort of working relationship or friendship started. <laughs> Mena. Uh, well, I, I might start by when I first saw him as opposed to when I first met him. Uh, I first saw him with the Kirov ballet, as it was at that time, and it was in Nabayadea. And I can still remember, because everybody was talking about this young man, the the dancer who was going to be a huge star, but he was really quite, quite, quite young. It was in Paris. And what I mainly remember, a huge charisma, yes, um, but the double assemblées around the stage uh, in the solo, in solo's solo. Um, and not only was it uh, fearless, but it was also what uh, we uh, ballet people thought <coughs> as quite dirty. 
because the foot went up this way instead of being pointed, and it's a yum ba da 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 dum ba ba yum ba da 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 dum, and so we're a little bit snooty about it. Yes, but 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 but, but it was it was miraculous, and then later. Soon after, I think he defected, and uh, it was all over the papers, everywhere, everywhere. And I had the good fortune to be uh, allowed to watch <coughs> from the wings the Marquis de Cuevas company, uh, where he first danced in Paris. And he danced in The Sleeping Beauty, a production that was uh, a very wild um, uh, costume designs by Raimondo de Lara, who was the nephew of the Marquis de Cuevas very outlandish, and uh, Nureyev was brought in to dance both the Prince and the Bluebird at that time. <laughs> and I would sit in the wings and, uh, and watch this extraordinary creature, uh, who at that time was, I think, not allowed to hold up the curtain until he felt that he was ready, which <laughs> happened later on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I read that at his dancing at that time was described as almost savage by, by Western standards. Yes, indeed. I think it was the, the, the fearlessness and, of course, the personality, the charisma, the animal-like feline um, quality of it. Um, but it, it wasn't by the book. This, um, this came later. Yeah. More to be described, I think. And Patrick, who wasn't even born when he defected. <laughs> Almost not, no. Um, I met him the first time. I just joined my first company in France, and then he came uh, guesting with the company. And then a few months later, I got a call from the director of the company that he picked me up to then step out of the with him. Who oh, was quite amazing. I was 17 at the time, and uh, nor yet for any kind of male dancer wanted to have a career was the um, ultimate and um, the, the bigger thing you can have. And, um, How old was Rudolph at the time? Uh, he must have been in his 40s, early 40s. Okay. And, um, and I ended up dancing that Pas de for two men that Béjar created mm -hmm. for him in the 70s. Uh, but it was very quick. So then he decided, I just learned about it with Daniel Lomel, who was um, a Béjar dancer. We came actually to dance with him the first guesting we did it, the first, when, the first time he came to guest with the company. Because he used the company for his own touring, and because it was such a name, then he could take the company anywhere, and it was great for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we went everywhere. But he came to dance with his usual partner, who was Daniel Omel or Jean Vizrix. And then, but he always wanted to use young dancers, and then suddenly he picked me up, and then, you know, in, in six months later, I was in Paris dancing with him. Yeah. It was quite amazing. We're going to get into this particular ballet because I think it's so important, and uh, it's called, uh, uh, by Béjar, Song of a Wayfarer. And uh, I know, uh, Mina, you have experience with the piece. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about um, Rudolph's influence on dancing and dancers. And I wonder if I could start with Helgi, um, particularly male dancing. Well, um, it goes a little bit what Mina was saying. The way I was trained uh, by the, was that you had to make everything look easy, your jumps and your turns and your partnering. And I think when Rudolph came on the scene, uh, he made it look hard. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow, uh, sort of, everybody accepted that because he would still conquer the steps. He could still do the steps, but he, he made them look hard. So that was a, a big change for, for dancers, male dancers of uh, my generation, to see that. Um, I think um, slowly he did, from the beginning actually, he did work a lot with Eric Brun, who was to me the, the premier dancer in Nobel. And he was just a beautiful technique. And I think Rudolf really tried to learn something from that. And I think he did. And I think Eric also tried to learn from, from Rudolf. But I think that was sort of the main thing I felt that he had this power and, and this incredible um, sort of force when he danced. And if it looked hard, that was fine, you know. And, and it, uh, he somehow could look at the audience and almost <coughs> intimidate them to, I felt, sort of to like what he did. 
and you didn't have to be intimidated to like what he, he did. He was just, that was, that's how he danced. Uh, it was uh, basically that, I think. That, it, it, that was the big change. It sounds as though he, he, uh, he, he wanted you to know that it was not something you could do. Right? <laughs> Some, sometimes sometimes uh, dancers make it look so easy, easy yes. that you imagine that you might be able to do it yourself, but it sounds like... And what didn't. I was amazed to see, I saw later on, um, that before he danced, before the curtain went up, he would dance his, vari let's say his variations two or three times full out before the curtain went up. Now most dancers would sort of try to save ourselves and put everything into that one chance we had once the curtain was up. But that was absolutely amazing to me to see that he had that strength to do that. And it was not just in the beginning. I think he did that all through his, his dancing career. Let's talk a bit about um, Rudolf as, uh, as a partner. And both Mena and Patrick actually danced <laughs> with, with Rudolf. Um, what, what roles did you dance with? Um, I had the privilege to dance uh, Aurora uh, in The Sleeping Beauty. It was uh, with the Ballet de Marseille when Rosella Hightower was the artistic director. And uh, they were dancing in Barcelona. And I was brought in, I was actually dancing with Maurice Bejas at the time, contemporary, more contemporary company. Um, but he allowed me to go and guest, which was really pretty unheard of. Um, but I had uh, three days to put it together. It was actually the first full-length ballet I'd ever danced. <laughs> and, um, but I always said yes, yes to everything. I was, never miss a train. And um, so I arrived in Barcelona. The, the stage is very, very, was very, very raked before that theater burnt down. And I, I had one day before Nureyev arrived. There was a tiny little studio downstairs at the bottom of the, uh, under the stage. Um, rehearsed a little bit with Rosella. The next day, Nureyev arrived. We put together the pas de deux in that tiny studio, which was, oh, about a, a quarter of this stage, I think. Flat, in fact. And then we went up on stage and did the dress rehearsal. And then we did five performances, one after the other, which was his wont. He always performed every single performance, matinees and evenings, uh, often eight performances, nine performances a week of the hardest roles. Um, and that experience was extraordinary because he was so helpful and um, I knew him a little bit before, but I had never worked with him or danced with him and I heard all the legends about how horrid he could be uh, but he couldn't actually have been nicer and more helpful, not only with his partnering, which also um, one heard could be edgy, um, <laughs> and um, uh, also with, with the variations. He was so helpful and had extraordinary hints, both technically and uh, artistically. There was, uh, it was later, I think, um, this story about uh, him partnering uh, Natalia Makarova in Paris in the, um, in the open air theater at the Louvre, Carré du Louvre, um, in the um, full length Swan Lake. And um, two Russians, <coughs> maybe, they always hit it off all the time. Uh, <laughs> and they'd had some sort of a, a tiff. And there's a section in the Black Swan Pas de Deux, where she comes along on a diagonal, young, <coughs> ta -da -dum, tum, ta -da -dum, turning, and he stands on the other end. And he was standing in his Nuria fifth position, waiting for her to come, not really looking at her. Um, and uh, his theory was that in that Pas de Deux, the, the ballerina should come exactly in front of him, and then he would partner her in a pirouette, which he would finish in a back bend or a split penche, depending on the version. I can't remember which one it was. Anyway, she did her yum ta da dum tum ta da dum, and she finished a little bit far away from him, <laughs> and he let her, and he stayed in his fifth position. <laughs> 
and apparently, I wasn't there, but apparently she landed on the floor and oh. and she stayed on the floor until she got herself up. I fortunately didn't have that experience. Just briefly, though, but the next ballet that I danced with him was uh, Don Quixote. Um, I did uh, Kitri, and uh, again, there were eight performances that week. He danced seven performances with Lucette Aldous, his partner from Australia. And I was performing three different roles in, in all those performances. And then the Saturday matinee, he did Kitri with me, which was extraordinary that he was prepared to change partners as well as do every performance. And Lucette was very, very small and very, very light. And I was taller, I wasn't heavy, but I was t a lot taller. Um, but he changed it, the rehearsals and partnered me and then went back to Lucette in the evening. But he must have been pretty tired and there was this strange situation where during the last act of Pas Deux, uh, Jack Larchbury, the great conductor, was a um, great ballet conductor, was conducting for us. And the adagio part, was played at a funereal pace, <laughs> but really funereal. But, you know, this, this is the way that uh, usually that Noria liked it. Um, but as we were walking out, I could hear him swearing under his breath. <laughs> I wouldn't even dare to say the words and get away with it. Um, all through that, that so far, I thought he was swearing at the conductor. But then we got to a balance situation, and he had my hand be, be my key tree. <laughs> oh, and I was supposed to take a balance in my own time normally. And <laughs> <laughs> And then I realized that maybe he was swearing at me for whatever reason. <laughs> Did he ever swear at you? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> but it was relentless. Um, he had to go on every night. He had to dance every night. And uh, my, my experience with him before I did Song of Wayfarer with him, I mean, I had few rehearsals. And then we ended up, my first night was at the uh, Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris. And we had dress rehearsal in the afternoon. And I was extremely, extremely, extremely nervous. It was like um, in Paris, I'm French, it was a huge theater, Noyev, everything. And uh, suddenly, dress rehearsal at two o'clock, then I got a little note, I'll see you tonight. Then I did the entire dress rehearsal of Song of the with a baritone, full orchestra, and myself on stage. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I think he was always testing you. You know, he had to, especially because he gave, um, he gave a lot of chance to a lot of young dancers, but then you had to prove him that you could do it. And that, that was his way to just test me if I was going to be able to do mm -hmm. it. And he just appeared at night, and then we did the ballet, and it went well. But, but he never appeared for the dress rehearsal, never. This, the piece, uh, Song, Song of the Wayfarer, uh, by Béjar, it's for two men. Uh, one, I believe Béjar says, is a student that thinks of it as the student, and the other as destiny. And um, you danced both roles over time. Yeah, later on I did the blue one, but that's, with Rudolph I did the red one, which was a little bit weird because I was much, much younger than him, yeah. and I had to be, I was fate behind him. And, it, right. you know, the, the, the theme of Song of Ifera, it's that the guy is following fate, is, the blue guy is following the red one. The red one is uh, instigating everything in the pilot. And it was strange to have chosen such a young mm. guy to be able, but um, he does have that, he had that vulnerability on stage too, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, he did work, I had a great time. There's a, well, you, you got a nomination for an Olivier Award, so. Yeah, once we danced in London, yeah, It worked. When, no, it worked, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it was yeah. the start of my career, because yeah. once that happened, it took me everywhere, I mean, for the next three years, I really danced a lot with him, um, in London, in South America, and, um, and then from then on, I ended up dancing in London, you know, that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to do, then he helped me a lot, a lot, a lot. There's a very poignant story about this piece um, after Nureyev uh, left uh, Paris Opera Ballet. Um, um, there was a performance where he danced uh, two of the songs with Patrick Dupont, who was appointed the, his successor. And so there's a very poignant uh, poignancy with him leaving uh, Paris Opera uh, and Patrick sort of taking over. So it's a lovely story. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about uh, the his impact on the male in uh, classical dancing. Uh, Helgi, you do something in uh, your staging of these big pieces uh, that I that maybe Rudolph was the first to really do, and that is making sure that there's plenty for the men to dance. There are really interesting variations. Can you talk about that thinking? Uh, yes, when I stage uh, my version of Sleeping Beauty, um, which is heavily female dancing, yet I, I had a company that had some wonderful male dancers, so I said, how can I incorporate that into the production without changing it in many ways. So I think that was the first time that I, I tried to do that. And it was more of a necessity that I needed to have, to have those dancers dance in the company. I, I didn't want to go through a whole week of Sleeping Beauty and maybe have just the Prince dancer or the Bluebird and, and all the other male dancers sitting around. So I think that's when I started doing those things. Um, and I. You know, I'm sure that um, that was sort of happening at that time. Mm -hmm. Rudolph did it, and um, it just made sense to me to do it. One, um, one piece that uh, is, of course, very popular, very famous, is uh, the Rimonda, uh, which he staged all over the world, uh, famously uh, in London, and that is the first production, Martin, that you worked with him on, I believe? Yes, that's the, um, it, I did some research because Rudolf hated the um, absolute flat tutu. He said, I don't want to see us hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was sent to do some research and I went and did research on Anna Pavlova and we developed, with Margot Fontaine's costume maker, Marjorie Rogers, we developed a new tutu which is a bit more sloping. And um, so we did that too. And when I designed um, the Kingdom of the Shades uh, act in Paris, we had this tutu and the French dancers didn't like it at all. So they sort of came to me and said, you must tell Rudolf we can't have this tutu. You must. And I thought, they've gone crackers. I mean, they don't know Rudolf. What Rudolf wants, Rudolf gets. I mean, point finished, you know. <laughs> so, so I was very surprised the other night when I saw um, up in the exhibition, there's a television screen, and your ballet is doing that very act that I worked first on with Rudolf, and there was the model I'd built. And it, oh, it was quite <laughs> shocking to see that. Yeah, great, <laughs> wonderful moment. That, that's true. Uh, we're doing the third act of uh, Nureyev's Ramonda in program six, I think, this season. Um, it's a beautiful production uh, designed by Barry Kay. Um, and it's actually the second time, Helgi, you've programmed uh, Raimonda uh, since you've been in San Francisco. Um, and the version we did in the 90s, I believe, was uh, uh, from um, Vienna. And I think that might have been Georgiatis. Yeah, the costumes were different mm -hmm. that, for, from that production that yeah. we rented. Can you hear? Yeah, so we have to hold it. Okay. Okay. Or maybe just take it off. Can we take it off? Sure. Maybe that's better. Yeah. Okay. No. Right. Okay. <laughs> you should have spoken up earlier. <laughs> now we have to start again. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that the version that of Raimonda that we're doing also is slightly different. The choreography. Uh, there may be another. Variations. Well, he had done uh, another version in in London, mm -hmm. and uh, I think this particular version of third act he incorporated solos from other parts of the ballet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So he, he, in other words, there are more solos for the female dancers right now than in the in the first production we did, and that's only because he had done it that way. He had taken solos from other places in the ballet. Because they wouldn't allow him to do the whole the whole uh, Raimonda at the opera house, so he just sort of sneakily decided, "Oh, I make it bigger," <laughs> <laughs> and then because there's some lovely solos in the first act and things, so he 
oh, that, from Clemence yes. and um, Dingen. So, beautiful, beautiful solo. Yeah, yeah. So he decided uh, it wasn't long enough. It wasn't big enough. He couldn't show enough what he could do. So it it is jam packed. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Not just with dancing, but also with scenery and costumes. It's like seeing a, an entire evening in one act. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, it's true that you know most people agree that the other two acts are not. Terribly interesting, but <laughs> but uh, this one gets performed quite a bit. Um, so Rudolph, particularly in his uh, time as director of the Paris Opera Ballet, was responsible for interpretations of many of these uh, story ballets, these classics, uh, and probably the most lavish productions the world has perhaps ever seen of them. Um, Martin, maybe uh, you've been through the exhibit a couple mm -hmm. of times. If you want to sort of share uh, any impressions you had on things that folks really should be looking for? Well, um, you, there's quite an interesting contrast on one, on one tableau up there. There are um, costumes that Rudolf danced in where he wasn't a choreographer and his designers didn't work on those costumes. And the contrast is quite remarkable. Mm. They are quite almost plain in comparison with the elaborate um, Georgiadis uh, costumes. It, it is, uh, I mean, Nico was an extraordinary designer and he had an incredible sense of color and proportion and also texture. He felt this, this has to, everything has to have a lot of texture on it. And um, I think um, he had it I, I went to Nikos' funeral, and it was in the uh, Greek Orthodox Cathedral in London. And he came in, and it was all gold and glittery. And then the, uh, I will almost want to say the performance started, but it was the funeral. And it's a Greek <laughs> mass, and there's curtains being drawn, and, 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 and all the priests run around in, in, in brocades and things. And suddenly we realized, oh, that's where Nico got it all from. <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting thing that, you know, if, if you're uh, in the exhibit, you'll notice is that uh, you'll see um, costumes that Rudolph wore. Um, say from 1974 when he was 36. But then you'll see one, uh, there's a Swan Lake costume. Uh, he was 46. Um, Rudolph danced a long time. He danced the classical roles uh, a long time. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, were you uh, fitting him during that time? I don't, I, I mean, I know dancers' bodies are different, but I know 35 to 45 to me, there were, it, would, it would have been harder for me to get into one of those. So <laughs> how, was, were you and other costumers, you know, working with him? To... I didn't work with him at the end of his career, so I don't know that. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know that I was able to get in his costume when I was younger. I would not. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, got, I was able to get in, into his um, um, uh, Marguerite and Armand costumes. That's a long time ago. <laughs> Please. Yes. yes. Um, I think one interesting thing, uh, um, Martin will corroborate, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, if you look at his costumes uh, for any of the prince roles, classical roles, uh, they're always very, very short, uh, pour point. Uh, and this was because he, I think he had a little bit of a complex, one could say, that he felt that his legs were not as long as he would have liked them to be. Yes. So he felt that this was a good way of making them look as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And there was even a thought that the tutus that have been described that were slanting slightly downwards would make his partner's legs look a little bit less long. <laughs> 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 yeah, it sounds like you really had to be on your toes, par par <laughs> pardon the pun, uh, if you were working with Rudolph. Um, so sort of following up on that the idea that you know, Rudolph uh, performed uh, for a very long time. Um, and he was very curious about dance, more than just the classical roles. 
uh, hence his work with Bejar and, and others. And uh, he always had a great desire to work with uh, Balanchine. And uh, even, you know, as he, you know, as he defected, uh, you know, he was intent on meeting Balanchine and, and trying to work with him. Um, but uh, famously, you know, uh, he was politely, uh, you know, he was basically d told by Balanchine, these are kind of the rules of what it's like to dance at uh, New York City Ballet. And that certainly didn't uh, jive with what Rudolph was, uh, see how he saw his career. Helgi, as a, a, a Balanchine a dancer, can you talk a little bit about that philosophy uh, of Balanchine uh, and sort of contrast it with where Rudolph was, was heading? Well, I had heard the story was that uh, when he went to see Mr. B, he was called Balance Mr. B, um, Balanchine just turned to him and said, well, when you're finished being the prince, come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there was a lot of things that Balanchine liked in his dancing, probably everything. But he was not going to put up with this superstar because um, I think being in, in the New York City Ballet was, it was more about a choreography, about uh, being there because you wanted to work with Balanchine. Um, when I was there from, I joined the company in 70 and uh, left in 85, just before I came here. Uh, it was considered, and many people say it was the golden age of New York City Ballet because Balanchine was choreographing a lot. Uh, and then uh, um, Jerome Robbins was also choreographing every year. So this was a, a time where the Stravinsky festivals, the, the, the Tchaikovsky festival. So everything was sort of focused on dance, creating uh, new works that would um, push the classical vocabulary. Um, and this is what Balanchine uh, did. And, and he did also sometimes choreograph ballets that he felt were needed. Um, for instance, like um, Union Jack. Well, it was a very popular thing. So he needed to do something like that and then be able to do his agon and, and, and four temperaments. Um, Stravinsky violin concertos. Um, but it was always about uh, that part of it. We are here because of the art form. We are here because of, of we want to create new works all the time. It was not about the individual so much. But yet, I can tell you honestly, Balanchine loved to have the best dancers of possible to, you know, to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just didn't uh, make us feel um, like superstars. But he, if you were working there, you knew you were, you were good. And, and that's why he, he had you there. In yeah, the I, I've, I've read that he had, had his ways of like, taking you down a notch if he needed to. to so. <laughs> so maybe that's why he said to, to yeah. Rudy, you know, when you finish being the prince, come and see me. Yeah. So apparently they, they finally did work together in uh, 79, I believe, um, near the end of uh, Balanchine's career in life uh, in um, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme. Yes, that's correct. Which, by most accounts, was not a success for it in, or pleasant for anyone. Did, did, were you... You were there. I, I was there, but not in the in the work. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I can agree with that. It didn't seem to work for either one of them, and it yeah. didn't seem to gel. Yeah, maybe it was too late for both of them. Let's move a little bit to um, Nureyev's um, curiosity, his uh, knowledge of uh, some of the some of the things that we're going to be seeing in the exhibition. Martin, um, you are not only a costume designer, builder, but you are a collector and dealer of historic costuming uh, and textiles. Mm -hmm. um, I recall when, uh, after uh, Nureyev's death, um, the New York Times did an interesting feature on his Dakota apartment. And uh, it was stunning the amount of um, textiles and, and things that he had collected. 
talk to us about his taste and where that came from. That I don't know, but his, his taste was very Baroque. It wasn't a minimalist, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> he loved brocades and he loved key limbs. Um, they, he had tons of obies and um, uh, oriental silks. He, was, he wasn't an oriental in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. He came from, from <laughs> the steppes and that, that influenced him very much. And I um, sold him a very beautiful mid 18th century court robe, a gold embroidered red dress. And um, I thought he would never buy it because he could be quite tight with his money. And I thought, oh, I'll just show it him. He'll never go for it. And it was the first thing he bought. And I said, well, we can only buy it if we can borrow it for an exhibition. We're doing an exhibition on the 18th century in Japan. And, and then he got all kaichurty about it. And he said, oh, I don't trust the Japanese. And the Japanese ambassador in Paris had to get involved. And it was all, but we got it. And then the exhibition moved to New York at FIT. And Laura Sindebrandt, the director, went up to the Dakota to collect this dress. And she rang the doorbell. And the door opened, and she was looking down. And then she saw a pair of nude feet, and then her eyes traveled up, and a nude leg, and a nude, a nude everything. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> but we got the dress. <laughs> <laughs> and she got a shock. <laughs> <laughs> but you can certainly, um, because he worked very closely with his designers. Yes. In the exhibition, uh, the richness of uh, the materials and, as you said, the texture, uh, it's apparent his influence yeah. on the... And he was very... Um, when you designed costumes for him, he was very specific what kind of material he wanted because he knew what the costume had to do for the dancer, that the costume had to help the dancer. I occasionally said, I want the, I want the costume that finishes the phrase, mm -hmm. that doesn't, you stop and the costume comes poof, mm. and it has to continue and all, and all that. And one of his, fa one of his favorite costumes was the um, Ginger Rogers feather number from Top Hat. And he said, I want that kind of movement for my costumes. And when we did Raimonda in Zurich, and Raimonda has a sort of dance, he dances with, with a veil, and, and we went to the big um, fabric house in Zurich and started choosing this veil, Nico and I, and we're throwing up bolts of fabric in the air to see which one would come down nicely <laughs> and slowly. And I think everybody in the shop was looking at us and they were, they're mad, what are they doing? <laughs> But he was very specific about fabrics. Yeah. He, he was particular about his tights, too, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then he had this, I mean, Don Q, he wore a pair of black tights on top of a pair of pink tights. What was to that about? Well, to shape his legs, oh. he thought, yeah. An old trick from Ufa, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, no, he he's had such an appreciation for um, for these richness. It's, it's interesting, given that he was uh, he grew up in poverty, uh, was in fact born on a train in Russia, um, in the Soviet Union. So um, it just I think demonstrates just how very curious he was to to and and I've heard that. He would see everything. I mean, he was just, Absolutely. you know, hungry to experience uh, art, you know, popular uh, culture and art as well as uh, classical. And he was obsessed by film. Mm -hmm. He saw every movie that came out. Mm -hmm. And also, he, I mean, he really loved antique shops. And I, I, I went to Milan once, and I went to an antique shop, and he was already there. <laughs> <laughs> Buying up everything before you could... Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> he uh, apparently had a great collection of the old masters, uh, you know, yes. in, yeah. in his yeah. apartments. There are two apartments, one in Paris. I think, Helgi, did you say that you had been to his... Yes, I had seen his apartment in, in Paris, and it was just filled with... Uh, Nothing match. I mean, it was just maybe an Egyptian bed, four poster beds, or uh, Greek sculptures, and, and it was just, you didn't know where to walk because there was so much in the apartment. But, um, I'm sorry, what were you talking about just before? Sort of that the richness of texture and his, his sort of 
intellectual curiosity about art. Oh, oh sorry. I, I <laughs> no, if I can say something, yeah. sorry. But, yeah. uh, when we went on tour, it was quite amazing because you could have a, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> when you went on tour with him, you had, you had that thing, even if you, he was doing every single performance all week and often matching and evening, suddenly you would have a note at the, the night before, I meet me at eight o'clock from his assistant, we're going to see a church or a museum, and he was, and I don't, honestly, I didn't really want to go, but he was <laughs> always, always going everywhere and seeing whatever he could do. It was very interesting during hours, yeah. And then he was in class before anybody else. Yeah. Um, when I, uh, may I? when I was um, <coughs> performing the Don Quixote with him, it was his production. It was in Marseille that time. And he was there for three weeks rehearsing the company. So he would uh, do his class. He would rehearse the company the whole day, meticulously, to the last sword bearer, every eyelash, every... <laughs> artistic side as well as technical side. I mean, extraordinary. He was a wonderful mimic as well. And then <clears throat> around 7 o'clock, we would go and eat in the Italian restaurant next door to the opera house in Marseille. And after dinner, we'd go back to the theater. He would then rehearse all his solos. And then uh, I had the wonderful experience that he was never very happy with the gypsy pas de deux in the second act of uh, Don Quixote. So he decided to re-choreograph it. So we would do that around 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And then, <clears throat> then I would go back to her hotel, and he would no doubt go out gallivanting <laughs> um, till 5 o'clock in the morning and uh, be back in there for class at 9, 30. And uh, that, was, that was part of a course. That's how he lived, That's continually. Amazing. And it, it's been said that when he danced with a company... It, it made the company dance better. Is it be because of this drive? Oh, absolutely, because you, you, you couldn't be left behind. And, <laughs> and he despised you if, you if if you were. He challenged you, as Patrick said. He challenged people. And he wanted to see how they would come back at him and if they would, um, <clears throat> in a way, if they would compete with him to a certain extent, I think. And he only respected people who really were... Uh, close to as hard-working as he was. And, uh, and if you weren't, he just had no time for you. He, must, he did not suffer fools. <laughs> there was no <laughs> doubt about that. It must have been a little intimidating for an 18-year-old. It was. What, the thing with Rudolf is what's no compromise ever, ever. And um, you can see in his choreography after that he made everything very difficult. He had that thing that the most difficult it was you were going to improve. You could not change a step, you could not, and he made everything, whatever, you can see in his choreography from an original um, Sleeping Beauty or Nutcracker solo, he made it 10 times harder. And but it wasn't just to make it harder, because if you had to dance it every day, you, you had no choice that to improve. And the non-compromise was quite amazing with him. You know, even at the end of his career, he will not, he will go on stage, could barely walk, but he will do and do and do and make you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. But also in relation to holding, uh, to um, doing his solos two or three times before the curtain went up, as, uh, as Helgi was mentioning, um, and sometimes he just was not happy with the way he was doing them. So he would hold the curtain up to an hour. Um, <laughs> Was, was really quite, uh, happened very, very often because until he was satisfied with the way it was going, he was not going to let the audience see it. And there was, there was one more thing in relation to what um, Patrick was saying of how difficult he made the choreography. Initially for himself and later on in the productions that he choreographed. And I think it, it was his legacy and he meant it to be his legacy that um, I was going to say the male dancers, but that everyone participating in his ballet was going to be challenged and was going to go to the ultimate peak of their performance. And indeed, I, I see it and I appreciate perhaps his productions more for that than for anything else at this point, um, that I, when I see dancers performing in his ballets, rehearsing in his ballets, I can see, ah, yes, they are really being challenged and they're really going to 
the top of what they can do. He's left us that. And they're not going to be just left with um, uh, a, a little bit of change here, a little bit of change there to make it easier. No. And, and you, don't, you can't go on stage without um, pushing yourself uh, to uh, make it as good as, as you can. You don't want to make a fool of yourself on stage. So because of not making a fool of yourself with that choreography, you're pushed to your limits. I remember uh, the first time um, Helgi programmed uh, Ramonda Act Three, uh, hearing one of uh, the male dancers complain uh, because sometimes, you know, if something goes in one direction but you're more comfortable going and turning in the other direction, you can change it up. Uh, but there was no compromising in the Nureyev uh, choreography, so the dancer had to had to push through and turn in a way that wasn't particularly comfortable. And very often uh, turn both to the right and to the left, yeah. whereas in a normal classical solo, you will only turn to your best side. Yeah. <laughs> um, talking about uh, late curtains, this, it was in Chicago, and the curtain was about 10 minutes late, and he was doing his. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the audience started to slow clap. Mm. And suddenly he went, and he the curtain, opened the curtain, put his head out and went, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and when we were in, in, in Rio and he was doing um, Balanchine Aporon and you know the solo is quite intricate, you know, it's like knitting. And the conductor went faster and faster and faster and faster. And I thought, he's going to fall over if he does the choreography. And you know how he always did the choreography. He was a stickler for it. And suddenly he just stopped and went, stop, start again. <laughs> During the performance, you know. <laughs> he wanted to make sure everyone had the very best possible experience, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I saw him do that, um, stopping the performance in Italy towards the very end of his career. I don't remember what the ballet was. It was an outdoor theater <coughs> somewhere outside Venice. And photographers were clicking away, and he got furious. And he just stopped everything and said, you, stop. <laughs> but, and he, would, he, he wouldn't start again until they'd put their cameras away. Mm. I should say something about that. Uh, it has nothing to do with Nureyev. I was in Copenhagen as a young student, and I went to see a show of Marlena Dietrich. And um, the photographer started coming in front of the stage and photographed, and she stopped, and she said, either you work or I work, but we don't <laughs> work together. <laughs> I'd like to touch a little bit about um, uh, Nureyev's San Francisco connections. Um, he had a bit of a family here, sort of an adopted uh, American family, uh, Armin Baliantz, uh, and uh, her daughter, Jeanette Etheridge. Uh, Jeanette, who serves on the uh, Nureyev Foundation board and was a great personal friend. Uh, they are local. and. Uh, took in not only Nureyev, he was the first, but also other Russian dancers uh, who defected. Um, and uh, he and Margot Fontaine actually did a short guesting stint with uh, San Francisco Ballet uh, in 1964, I think. Um, and of course, everybody knows about the, the famous story of them. <laughs> getting caught in a police raid uh, after a performance uh, in The Hate where the police were looking for marijuana. And, and I, as I heard, uh, Margot was found on a rooftop under her ermine cape. Um, <laughs> but it was all very, very dramatic. But, um, but Helgi, you also, uh, it was late in uh, Rudolph's career, and um, you will see in the exhibition there is a poster uh, with uh, Rudolph uh, uh, in a tuxedo, in tails, and um, uh, a baton. And he turned to conducting uh, at the end of his career. Uh, again, demonstrating just his intense uh, 
interest in all things artistic. And um, you actually had invited him to conduct. Yes, um, it was Janet that approached me about that, and uh, he was very interested in conducting uh, the orchestra. And would I possibly give him the opportunity to um, come and conduct for us? And at the time, we were going into a, we're coming up to a Nutcracker um, showing, and uh, I said, yeah, why not? So I went to um, Dennis Dikato, the um, music director we had at that time. And Dennis was not very happy about this. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he was not a musician per se. And, and, and I said, uh, Dennis, uh, this was sort of late in his, his career uh, in, in Rudolph's. And I said, listen, um, you know that the orchestra could play the whole performance without a conductor. We do, th we do 32 performances every year. So, they, you know, I know Dennis, you do a great job, but you know, they probably could. So why don't you give him that opportunity to have a, you know, do that? So he said, okay, so yes, I invited him. But uh, unfortunately at that time, it was too late. He was not well, so it did not happen. Jeanette, uh, Jeanette told me that um, she was with him in his last uh, trip to his home in St. Bart's um, uh, before he died. And uh, he carried the, the score to Nutcracker with him and, and worked on it, studied it every day. He was uh, very much looking forward to coming. Yeah, no, he, coming. he communicated that to me, that thank you for doing that. He was wonderful, I can't wait. And, and he was just thrilled that he was going to have that opportunity. I think uh, before we um, ask you if you have any questions, I'd like to just sort of turn to the panelists again and, and just ask you to anything we haven't touched on, any special remembrances of Rudolph uh, that will, especially those that will help uh, the folks who are going to enjoy this beautiful exhibition over the next, uh, next weeks, uh, really try to understand uh, this man and his impact on what we do? Um, there is a connection to um, the Danish uh, school that he was exposed to through Eric Brun first. And then later in, in New York, uh, there was this Danish teacher, Stanley Williams, who came uh, to Balancing Broad to the School of American Ballet. And uh, actually, he started the same year that I came as a student there. Uh, Rudolf loved his classes later on when he was dancing and would come to class whenever he could. And you know, I just have great memories of having Rudolf in class. There was Ed, Eddie, Eddie Valella, uh, myself, Peter Martins. Uh, there was sometimes um, Anthony Dowell when he was there. Um, it was just all of us there in, in men's class, and, and we just were competing in, indirectly with one another. Um, and I think what, what was great for me that it, when I was dancing the New York City Ballet, we were in Paris, and uh, we, had a, we were just finishing, and Rudolf called me and said, uh, I'd like you to come over to the Paris and, uh, Opera and, and teach teach the principal, because there were separate classes for the principals. And I said, sure, I will do that. And I came over, and he sort of said, well, you know, you, you will probably teach very much like Stanley Williams, and because I had studied with him. And I said, yeah, but I can do that. So after class, he, he said, thank me. And he said, listen, stay for at least two weeks and, and teach. And I said, no, I can't. I have to go back to the company we are, we are performing. Uh, that would have been nice, but um, it was... Uh, my memories of him are so strong in class in New York with Stanley. Or there were times that in the summertime that Stan, Stanley Williams would go to Copenhagen for a month and teach. And if I was a bit, you know, not dancing, I would go there sometimes and study with him. And who would be in class there? Rudolf would be in class. So uh, I have great memories of that. Uh, 
I have one extraordinary uh, memory. It was um, when he was director of the Paris Opera. And at that time, I was director of the Australian Ballet. And we always had uh, some dancers on scholarships who would come over at Christmas and look at different companies, how they worked, have permission to do class and rehearsals and so on. And um, <coughs> I was with a, a very young dancer, 19-year-old Andrew Murphy, you probably know. And uh, we were in the corridors of a Paris opera. I went into the office to work out when, when rehearsals were, and it was the day of Christmas Eve. And um, Ralph received me, and uh, I brought in Andrew Murphy to introduce him. Rudy took one look at him, looked back at me and said, Mela, you give class tomorrow for me. I said, uh, if you'd like, uh, Rudy, it was Christmas Day. Yes, five o'clock here, and you bring boy. <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, I did. And um, Boy and I came <laughs> a good hour before because Boy wanted to warm up. Um, the place was completely empty. There was one miserable caretaker who had to come in because Mr. Monsieur Nouret <laughs> peut travailler in le jour de Noël. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went up to the, the big uh, rotonde and uh, eventually... In came Rudy, uh, in his cap and a hundred things, over his practice clothes. In the studio, he shedded his uh, ordinary clothes, added about four or five pairs of tights, because he always wore a lot of woolen tights in, uh, in rehearsal and performance. Uh, uh, his woolen cap, which he also liked to wear in the class. And eventually put on some brand new shoes, and it was... It was oh, uh, uh, he could hardly get his feet into them. It was very, very late in his dancing career. Uh, and there we were, and I thought, now, how am I going to give class to Nureyev and this 19-year-old boy? Uh, so I thought, well, maybe it's going to be easier if I do bar as well. So I gave the steps, and I, and I was in front there. And during the whole bar, he was looking behind himself at boy, of course. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then after about four exercises, he started correcting boy and <laughs> doing all of this. I just wished I had a video camera. To, I, can, I can see it to this day. And then he did a complete class from beginning to end, including the jumps. And there were moments that were scary, and there were moments that were so extraordinary, because he would go into that extraordinary fourth position, you know, with, with the the the, um, the thigh completely turned out underneath and go into an underdone pirouette in a high, high, beautiful passé, do three pirouettes there. And it was a glimpse of the young Rudy. And then he still insisted on doing jumps. And eventually he made the boy boy work. And it was it was wonderful. But the be the best and most intense memory of, of Noriev was his humor and the glint in his eye when he was just about to tell either a very dirty story or uh, one thing that we, none of us have talked about, and Martin should, I'm sure, um, his way with words in the English language, his vocabulary. Because for, for a foreigner, he had a strong accent always, but he had a way of utilizing words and inventing words. Uh, often and very dirty ones too, <laughs> that, that really gave an insight into what what he m meant to say. You you couldn't mistake it. He could be very funny, yeah. and mimic everybody. He was a great mimic, but he also he got you know he had a a temper, and sometimes that temper wasn't actually directed at people. It was directed at himself because he was a communicator on stage. And if he then felt he couldn't communicate with somebody, he would got quite angry. And I learned very early on, you pretend you understand what he means, because in the end, you will understand. And one evening, I was in a club, a nightclub, and Rudolf came in, and the music was pumping away, and, and he said, hello, how are you, Bernard? And he said, I want you to organize corps de ballet for me. 
And I thought, no, it's gone crackers. I mean, what do I know? I said, all oh, right, Rudolf, we'll phone tomorrow. So I phoned him the next day. And it was Cordoba leather that he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> wanted me to organize for his house. <laughs> Did, but did you show up prepared to no, take no, care of no, the problem? No, 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 no. I thought, well, didn't, didn't have. At one stage, he said to me, you're my secretary. And I said, no, Rudolf, you're crazy. I don't want to be your secretary. I like, I like my life. <laughs> I, there was Luigi, the masseur, also. You must have known. Oh, yeah, yeah no, Luigi. Yes. Right. Luigi, yes. No, for me, but what... Um, because we always talk about Rudolf, and everybody thinks about the screaming, the insulting, the scene. But... Um, he was really generous, and he gave so many chances to young dancers. When he took over from Paris Opera, you know, there is ranking history in Paris Opera. You cannot, you've got to go to a quadrille, corifé, sujet, premier danseur. By the time you can dance, it's 10 years of your life that you spend in the corps de ballet. And uh, when he took over Paris Opera, it, you know, it changed the whole thing. You know, suddenly Sylvie Guillaume, Manuel Legris, Laurent Hilaire, all those beautiful dancers were in the corps. And if Rudolf wasn't there, it, they probably would have had to wait five, six years before they could dance all those main roles. And um, he changed all that. And you know, because of changing all that, it changed everybody thinking about all that, you know? It's like, you know, let's give chance to young people. And not that many people that such stars, they, they were thinking about themselves. And what he, even if he was thinking about himself, he had that thing about other people. He always wanted to give a chance. And um, a lot of, myself included, a lot of Dancers, we give, we owe him a lot, a lot, a lot. That's what I can say. Uh, but yet he said to me, very late in his, almost before he's, he left the Paris Opera, he said to me, they never appreciate anything I do for them. <laughs> <laughs> they do, because somebody like Sylvie Guillem, I just saw, and um, she just got given a great prize in, in Italy, and uh, she did thank Rudolf, and I was quite impressed, because they had problems together. But she still think that it changed her life and um, uh, to a lot of other dancers. What was it about the Danish style that Nureyev wanted to learn? Uh, I think it was the uh, uh, the finesseness, uh, the articulation. Like Mena said in the beginning, he danced a little bit sort of dirty. I mean, it wasn't absolutely beautifully presented. It wasn't very articulate. It wasn't, and I think maybe that's what he tried to get uh, from Eric Brun, which was the Danish style. Um, I would imagine, and and of course there was in the Bournonville style. There's a lot of um, battement with the feet fast footwork, um, which shows up in a lot of his choreography. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he was influenced by that. Uh, he never said that to me, but I, just seeing him dance and knowing he was around uh, Eric Brun and then later on Stanley Williams that again would emphasize those things. So there was clearly um, something that he was aware of in his own dancing that he thought um, he could learn uh, so certain I think so, yes, elegance definitely. and finesse. Yeah. And like he was always hungry to learn and, and, and experience new things. Right. Interesting. Um, this is a good question. We should have started with this one. How did Rudolf pronounce his surname? <laughs> the, when he introduced himself to someone how did he pronounce it? Nure 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 oh, that's right. <laughs> so I guess the answer is Rudolph never pronounced his surname. So he never had to. So <laughs> Someone writes, if I remember correctly, at one point in Nureyev's uh, career, Martha Graham choreographed to work Lucifer for him, yes. Uh, an opportunity for him to try another movement form. Does anyone on the panel know how that experience affected him as an artist? Uh, did he find it fulfilling, challenging, interesting, or worthwhile? Any experience? 
I don't know directly about that experience, but I think it did influence his choreography later. later. Um, and Helgi's mentioned the, the Danish influence and Vornenville, Eric Brun, um, Balanchine. Uh, I think one can see, maybe particularly in his Romeo and Juliet, um, there's such a, a mix of uh, styles and technical uh, skills required, and the dancers really expected to have a, a, a knowledge of a, a Russian style, a Bournonville style, a Balanchine work, and Graham. And he really tried to, to amalgamate uh, all of those. Uh, that was my take on, on that. I don't know if you, did you dance that, Romeo? Very difficult, my God. <gasps> so difficult. Say a little bit more, uh, if you could, Mena, about uh, the association with Bejar, because in his hunger to experience more contemporary styles, uh, he did work a bit with Maurice Bejar. As did yes, you. he was very hungry for for um, uh, knowledge of all forms of dance, and more contemporary really fascinated him as the experience with with Graham. He was hounding Maurice Bejar. Um, during the late 60s um, for, uh, to, uh, to choreograph and create a work for him. And uh, Maurice uh, resisted for a, a long time. And at that time, he, hadn't, he didn't really work so much outside his company or he did theater pieces or opera, but not for particular individuals. And eventually, uh, Maurice relented. And actually, I had the honor to be uh, watching all the rehearsals when the Songs of a Wayfarer was created, which was for Rudolf Nureyev with a dancer from Maurice Bejar's company called Paolo Bartoluzzi, who played the Red Man, and who was a wonderful dancer uh, as well. And it was really the two dancers were like a, an uh, a Apollo and Dionysus. Um, um, Paolo was very much an Apollo, I can't pronounce it, Apollinian. Um, and, uh, and Rudy, of course, the fiery and theatrical. Um, and it's interesting because now I hear all sorts of different theories about what the Wayfarer was about. Um, and Morris, in fact, when he was asked about the meaning of his ballets, tended uh, to be... Uh, to sort of leave it to the audience to make up their own mind, and indeed to leave it to the interpreters as well. Um, but he did talk about um, a sort of master-student relationship, or guru uh, man, or fate figure, death, um, etc. But coming back to that experience of watching the, the creation, it was really extraordinary because Nureyev was not really familiar with the Bejar style, um, but he really tried to integrate himself totally into it, and it was fascinating. And of course, it was a work that he then took all over the world with him and danced with so many different um, red men. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a, I think it's on the uh, the website of the Nureyev Foundation. There's a wonderful clip, a video clip of Bejar rehearsing uh, with Bartoluzzi and Nureyev creating the piece, and the 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 attention, the attack, the drive with which he went at the choreography was just uh, really powerful. So you should check that out. Yes, hungry. He said you have to be hungry, and my goodness, he was hungry. Mm. Other questions? Oh. Thank you. Okay. When did he defect? That was in 1961 in Paris uh, while on tour with the Kirov. How did he feel about it? Uh, I think he was pretty, I mean, probably from what I've read, he was conflicted about leaving his family behind, but uh, was very happy to have the freedom uh, that he immediately experienced in the West. 
I think he felt very constricted by the um, the company, actually, the, the, the Kirov company at the time. And although I think he realized how much he owed his initial training, he started late, though, and there was always a sense of having to catch up, which perhaps explains some of his drive, that he always felt that he had to catch up with what he had missed as a young lad in the training. Um, but he did feel very constricted by the Kirov repertoire, and uh, he just wanted to broaden his artistic outlook, I think, from, from the dance point of view, desperately. And in the process, he clearly broadened ours as well. Uh, more on a lot of interest in uh, that part of his life, myth or fact, just before boarding the Soviet plane at the airport, did he turn around and leap like a gazelle over the fence? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that the great famous leap to freedom was as uh, uh, literal as that, but does anyone? <laughs> I think it was more sordid than that. It was uh, Pierre Lacotte. Uh, uh, recently, I saw um, a documentary on that, and Pierre Lacotte is talking about that. It was quite scary. I mean, mm -hmm. there were the Bourget Airport, and I mean, he could have been taken back really yes, badly. He, I don't think he did a gazelle jump no. to, uh, <laughs> to stay here. I, I've heard that he, you know, sort of ran behind the, a policeman. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, but it must have been you know, terrifying. He, he was uh, really putting himself at great risk. And, and he was kept in an office. He was, he was kept in, a, in an office and um, uh, Russian officials came and tried to talk him out of it. And there was even, a, 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 apparently, a, um, a nurse came on to give him an injection and he just refused. Oh. Uh, it's, it was quite dramatic and traumatic for him. Yeah. In the beginning, when I said, you know, very much a product of his own time, you know, what I was referring to was, you know, imagine this kind of uh, hunger, this artistic hunger for to be creative and uh, to have been to come out of uh, the Soviet system um, and to then all of a sudden, you know, just see uh, an opportunity and to have the courage to take it. Uh, it must have, um, it must have sort of shaped the way he approached the rest of his life uh, and he certainly how he approached uh, his art form. So I see that we've reached the end of our time. I did want to say a couple of things. First, uh, uh, how uh, valuable I think it is uh, for members of our trainee program at the San Francisco Ballet School to hear about the tradition of their art form. And so we're very happy that you're here. Uh, we hope that all of you will visit us at San Francisco Ballet during the season, uh, especially to see uh, act three of Rudolf Nureyev's Remonda uh, in program six. Um, and finally, on behalf of San Francisco Ballet, I'd like to thank uh, everyone at the Fine Arts Museums who've been such fantastic uh, partners and allowed us to collaborate on this very important exhibition. So thank you all. Thank you, panelists. <laughs>